Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Wars Live, where we explore today's digital revolution by speaking with business executives and thought leaders who are changing how the world lives, works, plays, learns, and dreams. Our guest today is Wayne Saden, who is a transformational C-level executive. He's been a CIO, a CDO, and a CTO. Wayne advises boards and CEOs on how to infuse digital into their overall business strategy and to succeed in the digital economy that's coming on us. Wayne, welcome back. Always a pleasure to have you here on Cloud Wars Live. Happy New Year and glad to be back, Bob. Wayne, good to see you. Um, Wayne, you know, a couple things here. We've, you know, turned a leaf here on 2020. Uh, I know we wanted to talk a little bit about Microsoft and some recent claims they made about migrating to uh, the Microsoft Cloud. But Wayne, just take a minute, give us your sense, because you talked to lots of boards of directors, you talked to CEOs and other C-level executives. What's your sense here at the beginning of 2020 of sort of the level of preparedness that executives have for the, you know, the, the wave of new types of business that's coming at them? Well, they have the same level of preparedness they've always had, somewhere between deer in the headlights and what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. uh, technology is foreign to most of the companies I work with. I work with manufacturing companies, logistics companies, construction companies, not the East Coast, West Coast, hyper environment, Google type companies. I work with legacy companies. Their technology stack is 30, 40, 50 years old. Their executives came up in their industry. And so they're all trying to figure out what is this digital transformation, digital disruption? What does it mean to us? And then what do we do to get started? And so some of them are coming to me and saying, what do we do to get started? Others are just saying, I've read about it. Tell me what it means. Uh, so I'd say there's a lot of interest, a lot of fear. And then when we start explaining that it means a lot of work on their part, they can't just outsource it to a person like me. Uh, they have to think hard, and that's a little scary for an established executive. Yeah, Wayne, just let me follow up real quick on that. So when they come to you and say, and pretty much ask you for your counsel on this, what are the top two or three things you advise them to do? Well, the number one thing they've got to be looking at is what do they want to be seen as by their customers? Bear in mind, digital transformation, terrible pair of words, digital and transformation, Everybody focuses on digital. Digital transformation is when they, the executives, the board, the C-suite, rethinks the culture of the company. How do we want to share information among our employees? How do we want to share with our clients, with our prospects? Um, how do we want the work environment to feel? It talks about markets. What market are we in? Are we in this, you know, the, the people who define themselves as we are buggy whip manufacturers were passed by when the auto industry emerged. The people who define themselves as leather manufacturers switched to driving gloves and prospered. So defining your market really matters. Um, it's about your products. We start with the core product. This is the thing we do. We, we build uh, steel. We put in sprinkler systems. We deliver truckloads of stuff. But the real product the customer buys may be information about that thing you do. Uh, 40 something years ago, Walter Riston, the architect of Citibank said information about money is as valuable as the money itself. And that was pretty revolutionary back then. And a lot of the investment bankers said, Hey, that's true. And now they're masters of the universe. And lots of other companies said, no, the thing we make, the core product is what we're selling. And that's not the world we're in. So, so products matter. And then the customer experience. We all live in the world of our phone gives us instant gratification. Everything is online with video. So how are we in a traditional legacy company catering to that desire for 24 by seven, for interactivity, for uh, uh, transparency? And if you're not thinking about how you can build a product and a company that supports that model, you're gonna get Uber and Amazon out of business. It's just the way the world is working. Somebody will figure out a way to do what you do better, faster, cheaper, more fun. And you've got to be thinking about that. Then when you have some ideas about what you might want to be when you grow up, a guy like me can come in and say, we can build this and we can build this. And we have to think about this because it's not ready for a couple of years. Or 
a person like me can come in and say, here are some tools. Here's what IoT might mean in your industry. Here's what uh, AI might mean in your industry. I'll give you a quick example. I was talking to a vendor and one of my clients does construction. And the vendor is working with a camera and an AI vision company to be able to identify on the job site when people might not be lifting correctly. And, and lifting badly is a way people put in workers' comp claims, they get hurt, stuff happens. And so imagine if you could scan your workforce and say, teach that person how to lift better and that person is lifting too heavy an object. Imagine how that would change your safety environment. And that's not the kind of thing somebody in a construction company would necessarily think about, but it's something some vendor or somebody like me can bring to them and say, what if we could improve your safety culture using video technology and AI? So it's kind of a, a two-way street. What do you want to do or what can you do? And then the goal is to meet what I want to do with what I might be able to do and build a product that is fundamentally different than the products they've been selling. The core still is trucking, manufacturing, uh, inspections, construction, but it is the augmented product, the, the basket of goods and services that we need to focus on. And technology, of course, can have a tremendous part to play in delivering that new experience, that augmented product. And so that's what the discussion should be about. Sometimes it's not, but that's the discussion I like to have. Hey, Wayne, that makes a great deal of sense. I, I think that's very helpful as you frame that out for some people who are going through that type of re, you know, reimagination. Who am I? Who do I want to be when I grow up? How do I get there? And so on. But I want to ask about that, uh, that AI-powered uh, video system. Can it help people with their golf swings? Yes. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story. I was an investor in a fitness business for a while. And the people who were running the gym had an iPad and a piece of software, and they would literally hold the iPad watching somebody run on a treadmill, and they could teach college athletes how to optimize their gait when running because they were doing gait analysis. Now, video gait analysis has been around a while, but a $600 piece of software on an iPad was new, and that was five years ago. For now, for all I know now, it runs on their watch. <laughs> But absolutely, the, the, the beauty of the AI environment is if you can build a model of what something should be, uh, the AI can, AIs are good at two things. They remember and they pattern match. If, if you think about that, AI does two things very well. So everything you've ever told it, it can bring up very quickly. So if you want to say, show me all the X's that are not Y, AI is terrific for that. Maybe it will even figure out that on Tuesday, you always want to ask that question. The other thing it's great at is pattern matching. You see it in Google's recent announcement that they are more accurate than certain radiologists at reading and diagnosing certain, I believe it was cancer, uh, because the AI is just parroting back what people told it. If you see this and not this, and sometimes that, and this is over here, assume some confidence. So yeah, I'm sure there's somebody, if they're not selling it already, then somebody watching this, go show uh, Bob where to find it because somebody's got it. Okay. And working on your golf swing, working on your gait, working on your ability to run the marathons better, um, and also how to make your safer on the job site or on the manufacturing floor. Great, great. Wayne, that's, that's uh, going to be fun to watch that technology continue to emerge over the next few years. And I think it's one of the reasons why, Wayne, you know, sometimes I think uh, when <clears throat> whether it's industry analysts or other folks talk about the potential of the cloud industry, that they undersell it because I think too often it's viewed as we'll take this old fashioned ERP system out and we'll put in a cloud ERP system and that's the change. I don't think there's enough thought that goes into factoring these entirely new ways of approaching work, not the same type of work, but how do you help prevent injuries? How do you help uh, not just prevent injuries, but then allow that things to move more quickly. How do you do that? And also add in some new types of data flows or insights that you can pass along to the customer. So I think we're just starting to really scratch at the surface of what's possible here. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm extremely optimistic about what 2020 and beyond can bring. Yeah, Bob, I'll just say that we did a, a video talk a while ago about that, that ERP in the modern world, 
is not just the old ERP picked up and moved to the cloud. And so if you're a CEO or you're a board member and, and your IT department comes and says, we want to move our ERP to the cloud, tell them, hang on a minute, wait just a minute. If they're going to pick up the old stuff that's been built 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and just lift it and shift it into the cloud, you are not getting the benefit that you just described, Bob because the traditional old monolithic ERP, CRMs, even EHRs in the healthcare field were built around a different model. The hyperscale cloud model of modularity, of continuous upgrades is really changing the capability that we in IT can bring to you on the business side. Uh, I, what I mean by that is we can implement AI or IoT or machine learning or uh, mixed reality, as Microsoft calls it, AR and VR, without having to make very large investments that we typically would have had to make. If I was running a traditional ERP product and I moved it to the cloud just by picking up the servers and putting my own servers in Azure or AWS, what I would have is my old ERP system on someone else's hardware. And so that, that's terrific maybe if I don't want to run hardware, if my hardware is old, if it's out of capacity, terrific. But now let's look at putting in a modern ERP. And I know the Microsoft one best, but Salesforce does it. Uh, Workday does it. NetSuite does it. They're, they're, there's not just one answer. They are architected around the notion that they're sitting in this hyperscale environment, which means if I'm running my traditional ERP, and now I want to do predictive analytics for my trucks to maintain them better, I can flip a switch, pay a license, and all of a sudden, the power of the AI and the IoT flows into my ERP. I didn't have to spend six months or a year or two years re-architecting the thing, integrating products from different companies. I can flip a switch, pay the bill, and all of a sudden be in the 21st century. And that's what people don't necessarily understand. Uh, the other thing with old ERPs is answer from the vendor is always, oh yeah, we can write that. Oh, we can modify that. Oh yeah, we can customize that. The modern ERP vendor says, oh yes, we can show you how to customize that. And, and that's, it, it's a huge difference. It's that whole low code, no code citizen development mindset. If you need um, a report change, then it takes four months to get it changed and $10,000. Okay, you'll have somebody with Excel really doing a lot of stuff in the background. If you can get a Power BI template that came with your system, and for the Microsoft license cost of, by the way, zero, because the basic license is part of the 365, tweak it. I want the bar chart to be a pie chart. I want this over here. I want to change the scale. I want to change the, the time period. Click, saved it. Click, send it for publish. Now, again, there's change control. I don't want to minimize that. It's not chaos, but if you're doing it for you or for your team or your department, it becomes instant gratification. I learn a few things, I take some video classes, and now I can be building an environment that works for me. And when you talk about customer experience, employee experience, being able to A, get to the information you want, B, manage by exception, not by reams of data. I never wanna know that the answer to my question is on page 217 of the report that got run this morning. I want to know the answer to my question is sitting in front of me with a red light blinking that says, do something. Um, and also that I can build a workflow that makes sense to me when I come in in the morning and open my browser up and drink my coffee. So you're absolutely right. The, the modern world of hyperscale infrastructure, hyperscale platform as a service married to a modern architecture, SaaS, ERP, is changing the way we compete in the core of our company. And, and one more thing, yeah. if you're the big company with the 100 million or 200 or 500 million invested in one of these old line, very large ERPs, you're actually at a disadvantage to the smaller, more nimble company. Because once I've invested that kind of money, people are loath to throw it out. I'm gonna replace my SAP with the new version. I'm gonna replace my Oracle with NetSuite. Those are enormous decisions for large companies. Here you are, a smaller company. Uh, maybe you're a billion dollars in sales, $5 billion in sales. Changing your ERP out is a lot more manageable because you probably customized it less if you've been listening to people like me. 
And because you have a better ability to execute, you can get people in a room, make a decision and go instead of going through 14 committees. So the, the race goes to the nimble in 2020. And I think that's an important thing. The race does not go to those with scale anymore. The race goes to those with speed and ability to execute. And the cloud, by cloud, I mean hyperscale, and the modern ERP solution with integration means that those that are nimble and those that are decisive can build something and change it and iterate and learn in a way that somebody married to a hundred million dollar ERP implementation using old technology simply can't do. It's the, how, how can I keep saying this? It's the technical debt problem yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. Wayne, that's a fascinating point you brought up there about uh, the 2020, the race will go to the SWIFT, not the, the scale necessarily. And with one of the other uh, digital all-star guests on Cloud Wars Live, Sean Amorati, we often talk about this notion because one of the things he's doing at Carnegie Mellon is the corporate startup lab where he tries to help big established companies learn how to be nimble, exactly the, the sort of the term or perspective used. And I guess if some of those big companies that have achieved that scale, if they're able somehow to blend the power of that incumbency and all the things they know and all the things they can do and all the capabilities they have with this nimbleness and agility and a forward look that allows them, as you said, they're loath to try to say, well, we spent all this, what are we going to do? What they've spent in the past, the sunk cost, whatever, that's going to be irrelevant. And if you look at it the wrong way, right, it's actually going to be an anchor that pulls them down. So for those big companies that are able to harness what they've done in the past with this nimble approach in the future, I think they're going to be awfully hard to stop. Well, you know, what is the saying? If pigs had wings, they could fly. Um, the problem is that companies get to be large scale by building up layers and layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy. And I don't mean bureaucracy is necessarily a pejorative term. It's what you need to do to coordinate 100,000 people across every continent in the world. I've worked with some of these companies. And so you've got to peel back the layers of bureaucracy. You've got to improve decision making. You've got to break down established fiefdoms. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that organizational behaviorists have been trying to apply. I've been in entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial environments where we're innovating in. I've been in centers of excellence. These are all terrific. But I will say, if you put a brontosaurus on a skateboard, it's still a brontosaurus. So we got to be careful that we understand the kind of change they're, they're seeking and that they're able to accomplish. And like everything else, I'll just say this. I hadn't really thought about it till you mentioned it. It starts at the top. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to another one of my favorite topics. Is your board ready and supportive of that kind of change? Because if they're not, and they want to see everything reported in these locked up custom, standard reporting frameworks. And when you're doing weird stuff, they get nervous. Your board may not be supporting you. So you need to be bringing, making sure that your board and your C-suite is totally bought in. And it's not just somebody over here. You know, the thing you do in, that people do in IT is the CEO points to the CIO or the CDO, chief digital officer, and says, make us digital. You know, make it so. And then we have to go figure out what that actually means and then build it. The problem is we're pushing on the rope. I'm down here, CEOs up here, boards up here. And now I'm trying to tell these C-suite executives who are maybe my peers, maybe my clients, what they should do differently. But you know what? That's not in their bonus structure. That's not in their long-term comp, which was approved by the board. Here's my five-year plan. Here's my earning, my earnout schedule. Here's my vesting schedule. And if those things don't align the C-suite individual incentives with the company desires, they will fail. I advise companies that have commission plans. If your commission plan pays you for that and you tell everybody to sell that, guess what they're going to sell? They're going to sell that because salespeople are terrific at that. It applies to all of us. So start at the board. If you tell me one of these companies has a board that's bought in, and I'll put a footnote. A board that's bought in should understand technology because that's part of the buy-in. So where is the QTE on that board? Where is the qualified technology expert? Again, we've talked about that in detail. If you don't have somebody on the board that's comfortable thinking about tech, 
and how it applies to your business problems of today and opportunities of tomorrow, you are still going to be behind the curve. So taking the technology knowledge, the culture desire, you could drive a change like that from the top down and make it successful. Remember I said digital transformation is culture first. Now, if you try to take the old culture, the old reward system, you get rewarded for size of your department, for dollars of revenue. You don't get rewarded for killing a product and replacing it with a more innovative one. Where's the, where's the reward for that? You don't get rewarded for saying, stop investing over here and start investing over there. So a successful large company has a tremendous amount of ballast that keeps it from moving quickly. Not saying it's not possible, and I know there are universities working with people. My, my question is, how do we, I, I tend to be more of a mid-market person, the kind of one to 10 billion, how do we uh, innovate around the behemoths? How do we take advantage of things that were historically not our advantage? We're smaller, we can't afford the investment, um, but we make decisions fast once we know what we want to do. So I think that's the challenge. If the big company can change from the top down and change the reward systems, change the belief system, change the culture, they can succeed and be as nimble as the small. But that's probably not going to happen unless they're facing an existential crisis. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work I do is around companies that are trying to reposition themselves because something bad has either happened or they expect it to happen. Our sales are falling, our products are not competitive, our, our uh, profits are down, our margins are eroded, whatever. Those are companies that are incented to change. But the typical successful company in 2020, lots of them are successful. It's kind of, there's a, how, how do I say this? There's a what's in it for me among the executive ranks. So that's up to the board and the CEO to build the right incentive system, the right culture, to make people want to do what you're saying. Change the culture, introduce the tech, make it more nimble. And instead of a brontosaurus, I guess, instead of a brontosaurus on a skateboard, you have a whole bunch of velociraptors <laughs> running in the same direction. Yeah, yeah. When that, that, that's really wonderful perspective on that, thanks. And I, I'll just, uh, one quick anecdote, then I wanna ask you some about this uh, claim that Microsoft has made. <clears throat> Is, uh, Cisco's a terrific company, have been for a long time, but about 20 years ago, uh, at the boom, you know, of the, the dot-com thing, just as it was nearing its peak, Cisco was very proud. They had developed, you know, sort of the new, modern, the ultimate uh, inventory management uh, that tied together, you know, what's the signals we're getting for demand? You know, how much stuff should we buy? How much stuff should we make? Where are we selling all this? And they thought this was like, one of the world's top information systems that allowed them to understand this. And, you know, for, because they said, we need this because at the rate we're growing, the rate the market's growing, where the market's headed, we need this system. And for the first several months, it was just great. And then one month <clears throat> in early 2000, the system started spitting out reports that said, cut back on production. You know, sales are heading down. And that, you know, every, the Cisco executive all said, we said, ah, Something's wrong with the system. That can't be right. So, uh, you know, your, your notion here about culture in that sense of where are you putting the incentives? Where are you putting the priorities? What does the culture reflect? Does it reflect what you want to believe and what you wish were so? Or does it uh, adapt to the realities on the outside and move along with that? So really, really, Wayne, great stuff there. Thanks for that. Sure. So, Wayne, we saw... Um, <clears throat> Recently, a Microsoft executive, I think he's general manager and CFO of their cloud group, was speaking at an investors conference. And one of the points he made, really, you know, my eyes popped open when I saw this. He said that because uh, a lot of the big companies Microsoft has worked with use various types of Microsoft's products here and there. When those companies choose Microsoft Azure, we want to take a lot of our on-premise stuff and migrate over to the Azure cloud. His claim was that those migrations can often be five times less expensive than if that business were migrating to AWS. And I know you've worked with lots of different sorts of systems out there. And I just wondered what you had, uh, what, what you make of that type of claim. Well, I think there's a lot to unpack in that. So we have to start with what's the workload we're moving. Remember a lot of cloud growth today has been 
move, creating new applications and putting them in the cloud. We're going to write something for the cloud. We're going to put it in the cloud, whether it's Google or Microsoft or Amazon. And so we're putting cloud native applications in the cloud and the, the fit is terrific. But a lot of what we're getting into now is taking legacy applications, software that is 10, 20, 30, 40 years old, technical debt again. And now we're trying to figure out what to do about that kind of the ERP and the cloud discussion. So as we try to move legacy workloads, the question becomes, how do we move them? It's very disruptive to do what's called a big bang. We'll just pick it up and we'll move it. We'll rewrite it at the same time. You've got millions of dollars and years of development and you can't just rewrite everything. And that's a longer discussion we can have one day. But the message for the CEO is, if you're a Microsoft shop, if you're Office 365 and maybe Microsoft CRP, and you're using their, their Teams and some of the other stuff, you're using Active Directory, Microsoft has done a terrific job in two areas. One is what I call ingratiating their on-prem products with the cloud. So if you're an Active Directory user, you can easily connect your Active Directory on-prem or in the Colo, the local data center, into the Microsoft Azure AD cloud. So all of a sudden, you've got your AD, your Active Directory, your security environment, your management of privacy and all of that. Now it's connected to the cloud. Click a couple of buttons, pay a couple of bills, you're pretty much connected to start. And so you do an acquisition, you know, I acquire a company, so I've got an Active Directory over here, an Active Directory over here, and I connect them through the Microsoft Cloud. Pretty darn good. There's software development tools that I'm using to run my software projects. There is a cloud equivalent. So I upgrade to the cloud equivalent, and now I can manage code on-prem in my data center and in the Microsoft Azure environment. And as I start to move it, the IT people kind of not quite click, drag, click, drag, click, drag. Hey, look, it works in Azure. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of that going on. They're ingratiating their old code with their modern equivalents so that moving becomes a matter of licensing and enabling rather than reinstalling. That's one. Number two, we talk about hybrid cloud. Again, that's a topic for a whole hour discussion. But sometimes companies don't want to just move to the cloud all at once. They want to learn it. They want to understand the risks. They want to understand the opportunities, the, the changes of cadence and how their IT department works. So Microsoft Azure Stack, which is not unique, but it's certainly a leader, gives me a way to take the Microsoft Azure operating environment and port it into my own data center. I have a client now that's looking at it and I've had others with great success. So I can take this code, bring it into my data center, act as though I'm the cloud, the same kind of techniques that Microsoft would want me to use. And then as I start to push stuff into the cloud, I can do it at my own pace and it's less disruptive because I've done a two-step. I've moved from the legacy spaghetti environment to the Azure stack on-prem, still watching the server lights blink, and then later on, I migrate it in whole or in part into the Microsoft Cloud, and my users may not even know. So I would say that if you're a Microsoft shop, and a lot of us are, um, there's a real opportunity to take advantage of the Microsoft architectural improvements that have been made very quietly and see tremendous pickup. Whether it's five to one, we'll let somebody who does this for a living validate. But I'm seeing tremendous uh, mind share opportunities. My, my users, my employees that are the technical folks don't have to learn a whole new thing. If they were going to Google, if they were going to Amazon, if they were going to some other cloud, they would have to be re-educated from the beginning. So if your IT people can do it easier, faster, cheaper, and your users don't see a change, and your environment can operate between cloud and on-prem, you can make a very smooth migration with fewer bumps, with fewer risks, lower cost, and uh, less time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna argue whether it's three to one or five to one, but it's certainly a big improvement over, let's rewrite everything for a new environment that we don't know, or let's just pick it up and drop it in, which tends to be expensive, messy, and often very, very risky. So that's a short answer to a question that we could dig into quite a bit. Yeah, Wayne, I, the, I, I like those perspectives, uh, you know, very clear on, I think some of those points you made about the things that Microsoft's doing particularly well. One of the reasons that I've got Microsoft, it's probably two years now, they've been number one on the Cloud Wars top 10, three broad, three broad areas. One is, I think they've done a very good job of evolving Azure, you know, helping it to 
become a grown up, you know, handle these, you know, some of the largest workloads in the world. The second one is, I think some of their go to market strategies, the way that they pair up with not only their reseller channels, but their customers, right? Selling, so if their customers create some really interesting solutions, Microsoft to help them sell that to other companies. And I think the third piece, Wayne, and you've uh, alluded to it here a little bit, is Microsoft has gone out, it, it isn't just Microsoft has been willing to form some sort of partnerships with other tech vendors. They have actively gone out and done it. So whether it's SAP, Salesforce, mm -hmm. uh, this, the stuff they've done with ServiceNow, but the one that was most striking to me was Oracle. And that is a big, broad, deep thing. And the whole point for that is Microsoft realized if we can make life for our customers easier, rather than taking, you know, inside the tech industry, headbutting competition and making that the customer's problem, we're going to be more successful. So I just wonder if you could offer a perspective on, on that. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I think when some of these old line tech companies sign up with Microsoft's Azure as their hosting platform, that's really a recognition that there's only three or four players around the world in hyperscale cloud, even Oracle, even VMware, Dell, even IBM are struggling in the cloud per se, the, the commodity infrastructure as a service business. Remember, that's a scale business. And like any other scale business, it's a race to the bottom on margin and you make it up in volume. You got to get more and more relentlessly, ruthlessly efficient. This is the Walmart strategy, uh, but writ large. And so if you are trying to build a differentiated product and sell it for a premium price, which is the SaaS ERPs and the other value add products that Oracle sells and IBM sells and Microsoft sells in their dynamics group, um, you don't want to be competing where a business requires you to put $20 billion into just building data centers. I think there's a recognition on the part of these other companies that it's a fool's errand to be in those businesses. Let's focus on stuff that is sticky. You're not switching ERPs overnight, although you certainly can switch cloud platforms very quickly. Uh, they are very profitable because you've got a lot of differentiated product there. I can't threaten SAP, I'm going to go to Oracle tomorrow, although I certainly can threaten Google, I'm going to go to Amazon tomorrow. So you've got to recognize a highly differentiated, highly high profit margin business, which is the business I want to be in, from the low margin race to the bottom commodity business that underlies all of this industry. And so I think these other companies are saying, why are we having this fight when I can make a much better margin for a much lower cost of cap, much lower amount of capital at risk, um, so more leverage by not in trying to invest in beating Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Tencent, whoever around the world at that game. From the Microsoft perspective, obviously it's terrific that they're willing to embrace. And so there's a recognition we've won. It's our underlying servers. We get to keep adding architecture. We keep getting to add scale, drives our prices down, puts pressure on our competitors in the commodity business. At the same time, it allows them to offer a broader range of products to their customers. And if, if the, if the, the uh, integration is just Oracle's gonna sit on Microsoft, then Microsoft wins, Oracle wins, customers at neutral. If the integration is we're gonna take Oracle stuff and Microsoft stuff and at the platform as a service level, that's kind of the middle layer between SaaS and, and the bottom infrastructure. And we're gonna marry those tools together. Now, Oracle wins, Microsoft wins, and the customers win. Because now I can migrate my Oracle Microsoft workload to the Microsoft Oracle cloud. So it's a matter of forming a partnership at a much deeper level than we're going to put our stuff on your stuff and we'll both make more money. So we got to recognize that it is, there are different kinds of integration. Some look great on paper, some mean one thing, but you really have to dig in and understand what am I, the customer, getting from that integration. Wayne, that's a great outlook there for 2020. I think it's, uh, it shows that there are some ambitious players out there and for the sorts of uh, CEOs and boards of the customer side companies who are willing to look at this, as you've said, transformation is a cultural issue, you know, above all else, the technology sits, you know, a few cars back on getting that ride together. Uh, it should be a great year for 2020. So Wayne, a final thought for you on, uh, on what's coming here this year? Well, it's going to be a terrific year. The economy seems to be doing well from everything I hear. My clients are pretty optimistic. Their businesses are growing. 
Now it's the challenge of keeping up with growth and keeping ahead of the competitors. And I think if we just pay attention to the technology and keep paying attention to the culture, uh, clients that are doing those things can win in 2020. Well, Wayne, thanks a lot. Uh, Saden on digital. Uh, Wayne is part of our monthly digital all-star team. Thanks for being with us, Wayne. Always good to talk with you. And thanks to all of you folks for being with us here at Cloud Wars Live. We'll see you next time.